It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Lindley Ostel Slater, MBA, UCCE Master Gardener, Sustainable Landscape Expert. Lindley inherited her love of plants and nature from both her parents and her grandparents. Her mother was a botanist and a science teacher. Her grandfather and father collected state fair ribbons for their horticultural talents. Her father also worked as a florist. Lindley described what she wanted to do in her life when she was in undergraduate microbiology and someone told her she was naive. Yet she now lives that intention by helping to preserve our natural environment and helping others to see the joy in nature. Lindley has been a UCCE Master Gardener since 2008 and has completed additional training in sustainable landscape and integrated pest management. Creating a sustainable landscape can be rather simple while keeping it so requires sustainable maintenance practices. Lindley will demonstrate sustainable techniques for your landscaping to save time, money, and habitat while practicing conscientious stewardship of our environment. Let's welcome now Lindley Ostel Slater. Uh, today we're going to talk about landscape sustainability. And I just so much thank you for um, having me. It's uh, uh, great to be amongst a UC crowd because that's where the Master Gardeners uh, originate is from the University of California. All the different campuses will have Master Gardeners associated with them. So we're gonna use water management to uh, make our landscapes more sustainable. And sustainability is the ability to carry on an activity indefinitely with minimal impact on the environment. Let me just see if I can, here we go. Ah, okay. So to live sustainably is to meet our current needs without compromising the needs of future generations. And there are three important dimensions that overlap. So we're in landscapes, we're balancing our social needs, enjoyment and utility of our landscape, the economic needs, our property values, expenses and wages and in income with our environmental needs, conservation, clean air and water. So we can all think of examples that might be bearable or viable landscapes, but when we balance all three, our activities then are sustainable. We don't actually have to change much to make a large impact. So how did our developments get this way? And let's see, I'm trying to advance. Now I've got an hourglass. <laughs> so I'm not advancing on this end. Stand by, please. If it's easier for you, Lindley, you can forward your PowerPoint uh, package to retiree link at ucsd.edu. My student, Chen Yan, is there. Chen Yan, you're in the office, right? Yes, I am. Okay. Yeah. And she could run your PowerPoint for you. Well, I think it's going now. Um, so, So what do martinis have to do with developments? My husband was a civil engineer working with the original developers of Scripps Ranch. And so the Mako de planning department, the architects, et cetera, proposed limited grading and retaining as many trees as possible with uh, interesting split level homes. And this would have resulted in an award-winning project. But the housing division, the real estate salespeople, they wanted to maximize the number of units per acre. And the salesman said in the meeting, 
a design award is not going to pay for our martini lunches. <laughs> so now my PowerPoint just went down. And uh, you may think I'm naive at PowerPoint, but I'm not. <laughs> Somehow. I really suggest you just shooting over your PowerPoint um, to us at retirelink at ucsd.edu and Chenyan can advance the slide when you say next. Okay. Just one second, please. Everybody be patient just a couple of minutes. I think this will be the best solution. I'm not sure it's going to go by email. It's a large file. I'm going to have to share it in a um, drive. Let us know when you've shared that and Chen Yan, let me know when you see it come in. Okay. Have you shared that, Lindley? I'm getting there. Oh, okay. I have to share it in a drive. It's too large to go on email. Okay. But probably in the meantime, it would have been, uh, I could have started it again. long time to get it up on my drive. I'm, I'm restarting. <clears throat> Okay, you can see the photo of me and the humming, um, mockingbird. Yes. Okay, here we go. Okay. 
So let's look at what can be done. Some of this, see this is Nirvana. It's a beautiful arts and craft inspired home. They have stained glass windows that depict the California coast. And we can tell that the homeowner and the gardeners care very much about this landscape because everything is very neat and tidy. Time and treasure are spent on beautification and maintenance, but what resources are expended? So there are some sustainable choices here, appropriate Mediterranean climate plants and drought tolerant species. The turf is limited to a flat area on top and not planted on the slope. And so why then is it not sustainable? And it's mostly because it's not maintained in a state sustainable way. So can anyone identify this plant or maybe a, this one? Let's take a closer look. So do you think a butterfly would know what this is? Can you guess what this shrub might be? How about Disney's lollipopii? I call it a victim. The poor thing has not experienced a flower in its unfortunate life here because it's always been subjected to geometric torture. The soil is compacted, the roots are bare from excess erosion, from overwatering, and there's moss and may. So this was me whenever I drive by this uh, house in my neighborhood. It was heartbreaking. The sculpture, sculptor is very careful to maintain the globe shape, except on that one side where the irrigation is because they're trying to keep it clear and that's a good idea. But these drought tolerant plants don't need supplemental irrigation on this coastal site. So uh, this is actually pink princess Escalonia, which has beautiful dark pink and another variety has light pink blooms early spring through fall. It attracts birds and butterflies and it's water, water wise. And there are more than 20 on this landscape, but none of them were in flower because they'd all been pruned severely and often. And this one is the second uh, topiary that they built on the hillside. And it's really even hard to tell what it is now. You might call it Disney's Coney Eye. And would a bee know what it is? It's hard to say because there are no flowers to attract the bees. How did it get like that? First, there's boots on the ground and then hedge trimmers and rakes and blowers and polluting trips to the landfill. Then there's danger because it takes two men to hold ladder on the slope and one man aloft with the gas powered hedge trimmer. And some of us find this highly sculptured look appealing, but just like maintaining a close haircut, this does require attention every month. It is a Melaleuca nosophila, which is a long blooming plant, more than nine months a year, but you wouldn't know it by looking at our subject garden. So overwatering, how do I know this? Because this echium on the hill was twice as tall as others in the neighborhood and it caved in from the sheer weight of overgrowth and then oversaturation from the overhead sprayer. Now it's good that they kept a, a clear path for the irrigation spray by cutting a bowl into the Ceanopus on the hill, but they have to use a power hedge trimmer every month to do this. So there's Ceanopus and echium don't need supplemental irrigation in this location. They also carve a, a hole for a, a rose bush on the hillside, but the Ceanothus is saying, I'm going to grow no matter what you do to it. I'm just gonna keep going and you can trim me as much as you like. And where are the flowers on the Ceanothus? So this is the neighbor's Ceanothus on the same day, untrimmed and feeding the neighborhood bees. So if you live fast, you die young, and Echium does the same. This pride of Madeira is short-lived with too much water. All of its processes are accelerated unnaturally, and the plants die in three to four years instead of six to eight years. And what's happening with the soil underneath? So we have a bare slope with erosion. Soil and all the chemicals on it go right down into the stream, into the ocean. There's exposed irrigation pipe, exposed roots, 
and no mulch because every week the bushes are sheared and all the trimmings are blown and raked, raked away. But all this activity does not prevent the weeds. So we have increased runoff here because the soil is compacted from repeated foot traffic. If we had mulch here, we could slow down the impact of the water droplets and let the water have a chance to percolate into the soil. So blowing off plants is more likely to dislodge a beneficial insect than dislodge the, the pest. So a parasitic wasp could be blown away, but its target prey, a scale, would remain. And I feel a sense of stewardship for these guys because it really doesn't look like a safe and healthy work environment. So just because we can doesn't mean we should. So to maintain this sustainable landscape in this unsustainable way, used to take three men, three power tools, a truck and a trailer, and a trip to the landfill every week. So common practices are not necessarily the best practices. Why are these practices so common? First of all, it can be just proof of life. Like when a kidnapper has to give proof of life before a ransom is paid, we take these cues to tell us that our garden helpers were there today. Uh, the rapid uh, and fresh, the lush growth, the uh, freshly trimmed shrubs, the rake marks in the soil, and no fallen leaves. So that contract remains. All these activities also are vertical. There's no bending required. There's less injury or workers' compensation um, from having to do bend over and use ladders, et cetera. But also, let's not forget that there is pride and a job well done. There's skilled workers that have been trained and um, really apply their skills in the best way they know how to make a neat and tidy landscape. So all this accelerated, accelerated activity, though, produces yard waste that take up the most space in our municipal waste stream. Science and society, we have progressed quickly such that we are able to produce vigorous growth and feed the world. In urban landscapes, we don't want to increase yields as we do in agriculture. In agriculture, yield equals nutrition, but in urban landscapes, excess yield equals waste and pollution. So with common methods, we apply and promote these pollutants in the landscape as well. And we do not intend these things to be food for our uh, aquatic friends, the route to our waterways is more direct than we realize. And we see that people care about these sites because they invest time and treasure in these neatly groomed and tidy verdant spaces, and they glorify our ability to bring nature into submission. But even though so many are accustomed to admiring this view, we no longer value this look. Power trimmed hedges and lawns are wasteful and beneficial insects and birds have little habitat. We don't have dominion over nature, we have stewardship of nature. So what can we do? We can nurture the nature that we have in our own gardens and landscapes and all of the actors care. The homeowner association cares, they're giving time and treasure, the workers care, they're expending great effort. We want them to know that we appreciate their talents. And now that we value sustainable practice most of all, we can ask them to channel their skills and desire and make sustainable practices common practice. So the first option to go to is a little to no expense option for change. And this is the just say no plan because we're gonna stop doing the things we commonly do now. And later we'll talk about if we stop doing these things, what can I have my garden helper do instead? And there are plenty of things. So let's look at the four things we can do at little to no cost. First of all, to optimize our automatic irrigation, discontinue hedge trimming, retain our yard clippings as mulch, and protect, practice responsible pest control. So first we wanna fix leaky nozzles and pipes and keep spray off of hardscapes and walls and just adjust the time on our timers to stop runoff. Keep shrubs and trees away from the spray patterns and clear submerged spray heads. Watering in the morning is the best 
since that is when we can capitalize on dew, which usually forms in the early morning hours. And then we want to adjust our controllers every two months for changing weather, weather patterns. And many people might say, why does this matter so much if the savings is small or perhaps you can afford your water bill? And that is because it takes fossil fuel to move water. The costs are much greater than just what appears on the water bill. Energy costs of water distribution are huge. They're hidden in our taxes and in our air and water quality. Conservation and management results in enough savings to power 120,000 households in San Diego alone. So take control of your controller and your brain is better than the microchip. Most residential controllers are simpler than an iPhone and you can control your irrigation just like you control your thermostats. So with scheduling, we're going to schedule based on our microclimate in our location, but our overall climate in our region. Uh, schedule for the season, for your soil type and your plant type, but also think about Plant water use does not equal plant water need. More water does not always yield better plant performance. So 30% of our water can be saved, irrigation water is saved from just maintaining your existing irrigation system. So if you did all the things that we talked about in the first part of this, 30% uh, is saved already just by making sure everything's working properly. But since the 70s, we've known, especially mostly through UC research, that plant water use does not equal plant water need. And that they've also done studies in reducing irrigation gradually over two years to stress adapt established plantings of common shrubs before they have a full reduction in irrigation. This eliminated any drought injury symptoms such as wilting or leaf dieback, mostly because we can apply less than half the supplemental irrigation that is commonly applied in Southern California. So UC researchers, um, Dennis Pittencher and David Shaw did a multi-year study estimating water needs of urban landscapes. They evaluated the aesthetic qualities of a few common landscape plants and ground covers under three different levels of irrigation. So a quality rating of eight is very good. Now with this plant, Pyracantha Santa Cruz, with three water levels, green being a third of what you would normally give the shrub, yellow being about 20% of what you would normally give a shrub, and red being no supplemental irrigation at all. That plant, Pyracantha, had the same quality rating in all three delivery rates of water. So they did this with a number of different plants um, in field trials and controlled studies and found that we could uh, reduce our um, landscape budget by about 50% what we have normally been delivering for non-turf plantings. But also we can, um, uh, there's a, a system called WUCALS, which is a many year process of um, estimating landscape water needs for plants. And they also found in Dennis and, um, and uh, found in their study that WUCALS wasn't necessarily the best way to go. It, 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 you could just use a simple method of a percent reduction to get the same results rather than programming each individual plant type into your uh, smart controller. We can also adjust our expectations and expect the shrubs and the trees to exist, exist at a normal pace of nature and uh, uh, have them look natural and not unnatural with tabletops and lollipops. So along with adjusting our water, we're gonna adjust our expectations. So there's a complete list of the plants that they studied and it's available at the UC Center of Landscape and Horticulture website. 
I have an electronic handout that I'll transmit over and that can be passed around to the group. So this graph looks very complicated, but it's actually very simple. So over on the far left, if you look at the green um, rectangle that says W, that's a warm season grass. And they learned that with a warm season grass, you can actually deliver about 36% of what you used to deliver uh, and still have good performance in that warm season grass. So they did that with shrubs, uh, ground covers, shrubs and trees. And um, the, the bright green in the middle shows that the more water you give, uh, give the more growth you get, uh, but you still have the same quality rating all the way down to limiting growth. So if you have a warm season grass, um, that in Miramar would be about applying five inches of additional rain in May. But instead of doing that, you could still get the same performance of that warm season grass in Mir Miramar if you only delivered about 1.25 inches of rain of supplemental irrigation at that rate. So smart irrigation controllers have all the scheduling math tools built into them, and that may be your easiest way to proceed in changing your um, controller schedule. So you also want to consider your soil type when setting the duration and frequency of irrigation. You can see with uh, sand, the water goes down much more quickly than it does with clay. Also consider what type of plants with, tree, uh, with trees you want to water out at the canopy drip line and beyond, not close to the trunk or uh, immediately under the fullest part of the canopy. Drip line and beyond, that's the best root zone for irrigation. There is a soil map available to the public at the web soil survey. So if you don't know what the general soil is in your area, you can go there and it will tell you exactly what you have. And I have rife, fang, sandy loam. And that's for sure because the percolation rate on my property is about 12 feet an hour. <laughs> that is fast, very sandy. So, the next step in the just say no plan is to discontinue hedge trimming. So this flat top naked legs technique is actually starving the plant and starving the soil. So we want this shrub to cut, shade the soil, keep the soil cool. We wanna hide and soften the edges of the hardscape with the exceptional qualities of this photinia. People and insects and birds want to enjoy the flowers and the berries. So when nearly all plants will eventually generate some waste of some kind, and this can be greatly reduced if you buy the tree or shrub that will grow into the size you want and no larger. So shrubs that are routinely heavily pruned are actually short-lived. You end up having a very thin crust of mutilated leaves with dead wood clogging the middle. These selective pruning techniques are illustrated on the UC website, and they result in naturally flowing an open uh, shape with a view of the sculptural qualities of the branches inside the shrub. With frequent shearing, the plant becomes bushier on the exterior and that shades out the interior and the lower foliage and the plant becomes a thin shell of foliage, uh, which is more prone to browning and burning from wind and heat. So over time, it's a lot of woody branches and few flowers. There are two basic kinds of cuts, heading cuts and thinning cuts. Heading back to a stub or a small lateral branch or a bud actually results in more vigorous upright growth, which is weakly attached. These new shoots are stimulated by frequent heading cuts. We wanna promote we don't want to promote inward buds because that will make a narrow shrub. 
we promote outward buds, making a wider shrub. A wider shrub adds more air and sunlight to the inside of the plant and results in an overall healthier plant. A good rule of thumb I use is, uh, is look at the shrub and see if a bird can fly into it. And that then you know you've done a good job in pruning. Thinning, which is what we want to do, we remove a lateral branch at the origin, maybe way back at the origin in the main trunk or further back on the branch and cutting to a lateral large enough to assume a terminal role. So a woody plant then responds to thinning by becoming more open, but retaining its natural growth habit and shape and does not usually produce a flush of new vigorous growth in the cut. So we cut to the buds that are growing out in the direction you want the growth to happen. And sometimes a bud may actually look more like a little dot or a sore on the branch. So the third thing is to retain our yard clippings as mulch. Leaf waste and grass clippings make great mulch and compost. There are many kinds of mulch and each has its good and bad qualities, but it's essential for any sustainable landscape. It's the one thing that has the greatest return on investment. So mulch will cover the soil surface, shade the ground, hinder weeds, increase biological activity, improve water percolation and infiltration into the soil and prevents evaporation, prevents erosion and improves overall soil structure and texture. These qualities far outweigh any negative qualities might, we might consider. The Miramar Greenery supplies a variety of mulch and compost at little to no expense. And I found also AgriService uh, in Oceanside and then the Chula Vista landfill provide mulch and compost as well. So here we have an example of a little to no cost transformation where we started with tabletops and lollipops that had not bloomed for years. This is variegated pittosporum or mock orange. So first we had bare dirt with exposed roots from too much raking and blowing and moss from overwatering. So one year later, we did not have to remove these mature well-established plants. We just stopped hedge trimming them. And then we trimmed selectively at the six month mark. In one year, we had these naturally shaped shrubs that shaded the soil along with mulch. We just allowed the leaf litter to remain on top of the mulch. And irrigation, we limited only to the root zone with no overspray onto the hardscape. Even with this greatly reduced irrigation, we had a profusion of orange scented blooms, reduced pests, and um, uh, more soil activity, biological activity in the soil. So now we have flowers on these uh, pittosporum every year. And this was three years later. Um, and five years later, we had not pruned again because we weren't overwatering. So here, this um, Melaleuca, even though pride was taken in forming the shape, there's an alternative that is less costly. We do nothing for several months and lace it out like this and then let it go to this beauty with layers of puffy pink blooms for nine months out of the year and verdant new leaves. The little to no expense options can be really the most sustainable options for change because you're not demolishing what's there and then consuming more in order to renovate. So you can keep what you have and do less to it, but end up getting more out of it. So for moderate expense, you can remove those orphan turf strips, any piece of turf that is not used for recreation um, is, is just there to get mowed. Um, you can remove those and replace them with um, planted uh, parking strips, let's say. So um, there's pervious paved egress points here for the parked cars. And then uh, there are drought tolerant habitat plants and shading plants suitable for the Mediterranean climate. 
And this um, hillside, a combination with turf, now here the turf is usable. It's a flat area that's used for recreation and socializing, but they don't treat it like a wall-to-wall -wall carpet because there's no utility to turf on a slope. That just creates more runoff and pollution and it's dangerous to most. But here we have juniper and bromeliads and cycads and succulents all mixed together and how do they get along so well in this oriental carpet-like display? It's because they eat at the same restaurant. They like the same food, they like the same water. It's, all their cultural practices are similar, even though they come from different places around the globe. And here in this case, all the irrigation is staying on the soil because these drought-tolerant plants on the slope are borrowing the water from the turf up on the flat area. So you can also invest in downspouts into barrels and rain chains into pots, et cetera. The city of San Diego used to have a water barrel project. Sometimes the county has a water barrel project. Those projects may be increasing now with the increased drought. But there are many other channeling and retention solutions also readily available. You can convert your old pop-up spray nozzles to high efficiency nozzles. They deliver water more slowly and thus the duration of your delivery is gonna be longer to help with percolation into the soil. Soil can only take up water at a rate of half an inch of rain per hour, whereas most standard size nozzles deliver water at three inches of rain per hour. So that's why you're limited to running an old fashioned um, nozzle to five minutes or less because the water just starts to run off immediately. So the high efficiency nozzles are not subject to uh, watering duration limits. So let's say you have a 10 minute water restriction, high efficiency nozzles are not subject to that. So all the major manufacturers have high efficiency nozzles, Hunter, Toro, Rainbird, they're all uh, very good, and each will have um, a variable that might be best depending on your site. And most of them are purchased at irrigation and landscape supply companies versus uh, Home Depot, which does not uh, specialize in high efficiency irrigation. This is an, uh, a little, a, a ret, what we call a retrofit. Okay, so it's a, it's a pop up body. When you look at your pop ups in your um, landscape, they'll, what's submerged is, what's the, is the pop up body. So you can unscrew that pop up body, put this one in, and then attach drip irrigation line to this. So this contains uh, the white, the cutout there where you see the white mesh, that's a filter. And then there's also a pressure reducer inside this body. So that prepares your system to accommodate drip irrigation, which needs lower pressure and some filtration to prevent clogging of these emitters. So this is the, um, you see that coil of irrigation line there, half inch tubing. Built into the tubing are these uh, small pressure compensating emitter, emitters, very um, high tech, but super resilient and almost bulletproof. When you lay this uh, drip irrigation line, you hardly have to address it for years. And it delivers water at a prescribed rate. You know exactly how much water is going on the landscape in terms of gallons per hour per emitter. And you know how many feet of irrigation line you have, so it's very easy to calculate. Whereas with pop-up sprayers, you really don't know how many inches of rain you're delivering to your landscape. This is a, um, another um, high efficiency nozzle that has a variable arc. So for all those strange shapes that you have, you can change the arc of the spray from 360 down to let's say 10 or 12 degrees arc. So here's an example of um, what can be accomplished using a moderate expense transformation. There were 10 parking islands at this site, which once took six man hours a week to string trim the edges, not to mow, but just the string trimming. 
and there was considerable and unsightly plant damage from the string trimmer and remnants of winter overseed that was watered every day during the rainy season. That was difficult to watch. And it looked pretty for a little while until uh, the string trimmer just whacked it all off in the spring. Then there was a little bit of danger in um, the, the large ditch that they were that they built into the, um, the parking curb because there was so much runoff, they were trying to catch it behind the curb. But here he is on this plant surface and he has to step down to the curb and then step down the asphalt at the handicap site. So uh, we started with the, um, the super hard hedge trim shrubs and irrigation flooding. They watered every day at the site. And then six months later, we no more power hedge trimming was allowed. And there, were no, there was no more mowing and no more string trimming. So the bougainvillea and the white trailing landana were in full bloom, giving a habitat and food for birds and bees and butterflies that were now visible every day. So the site saved 50% in their landscape water, which was almost 3,000 gallons per day less because they were definitely overwatering. And then uh, about $15,000 a year in contract fees because they could use in-house staff instead of a large staff for a lot of uh, intense landscape practices. So now we have long established hibiscus blooming year round, Indian hawthorn with blooms and berries and they actually use those dark berries for holiday decorations. And we added some bird of paradise and some gilt edge silverberry, which is Ellie Agnes. And um, uh, yeah, so most of those were the two plants we added. So now with full conversion to sustainable practices, you, you redesign and rebuild the landscape to get more utility while consuming re, uh, fewer resources. So you select plantings that reduce pruning, watering, and chemicals, and always choose the right plant for the right place. So we're gonna convert all of our irrigation to low flow, low volume. 90% efficiency is what you can get with drip irrigation versus about 70, 50 to 70% efficiency with overhead spray nozzles. And then third, we wanna retain all of our waste on site as compost or perhaps in worm bins. There's a, a really good publication by the County of San Diego on um, sustainable landscape guidelines and it's available as a PDF. Um, online. There used to be hard copies available, but I'm pretty sure they're all gone by now, but the PDF is really useful. It has a lot of specifics and helpful hints. So here's the beginning of a full conversion project. They used their uh, reused broken concrete as a pathway and then installed drip irrigation and made little rain retention swells on the slope so that as rain or um, mostly rain rather than irrigation water. As it falls down the slope, it hits this little mound and um, enters the swale and gives the water a chance to percolate down on site. And then there was pervious paving that was locally sourced stone and they added mulch to cover the drip line and drought tolerant uh, ground cover correctly spaced and not so many that you would have to do some active trimming later. And this was one year after installation. The color uh, and soil is uh, covered by plants and mulch and there are very few weeds. There's a new tree to frame the view uh, with energy and water saving shade. And no fossil fuels now are used in this colorful ha habitat for beneficials. So we can choose plants that can be allowed to grow fully and bloom in their natural course. There are lots of resources for that and many of them are generated by the University of California. So uh, here we have purple muley grass, yarrow, South African bulbs, geranium, santalina, protea, echium, 
Jupiter's beard, their globally sourced Mediterranean climate plants. Here's a mixture of edibles and other um, Mediterranean trees, ground covers, and uh, drought tolerant plants. That was the uh, Environmental Services Division up in Kearney Mesa, people who collect our trash. And this is a, a mixture of Australian plants, succulents, and small trees. With properly selected and maintained plants, you can have things to view as you sit on a bench or maybe a stump. Maybe you've added some boulders to the landscape, birds and bees and butterflies, and there's biological activity in the soil. This front garden used to be all turf in Pasadena, and this is um, after one year of grow-in as a Mediterranean garden. This is a California landscape, a uh, native landscape in Ocean Beach, all California natives on a pretty steep slope, really successful. And this is an oriental carpet display of succulents at the Sherman Library in Orange County. And this is a condo conversion that we did um, where it was uh, turf in the front. This is a high dog walking activity area. And they wanted to stop the overhead irrigation and make it just prettier. So we did a rendering that had some succulents, drought tolerant plants, um, of, um, a, um, a rock border to sort of give a barrier between the dogs and the rest of the landscape. And the, you know, the plants are pulled away from any hardscape and foundation just to keep any irrigation water away from structures to try to prevent water damage and uh, promote good drainage. So here you can see the uh, irrigation line just laid relative to the plants. And only, so the water is only going where it's needed. And then this was just a few months after establishment. Uh, the rock border, the mulch on the interior, and then allowing the shrubs to grow into the background. So when you're choosing these new plants, you might uh, have a lot of choices, but you wanna be careful about what you're choosing because if you were in the business of growing and selling plants, you know, as a nurseryman, there are things to, that are easy to grow and easy to sell. So, you would be looking for things that grow fast. You don't need to apply too many resources. They bloom a lot and they bloom fast and they make lots of babies. But that could actually be an invasive plant. So the first plant that appears in nurseries uh, every spring is broom, scotch broom, Janista. And it's just begging to become your new best friend, but it is a terrible invasive plant. California spends $85 million a year and thousands of volunteer hours to get rid of native um, invasive plants along our uh, coast. So the eight pre best practices of sustainable landscape maintenance are to landscape to your local climate, less to the landfill, nurture the soil, conserve water and energy, protect air and water quality, create and protect wildlife habitat, and perhaps even grow some food. So those eight best practices can uh, be followed on, in an online short course at our Master Gardener San Diego website. Um, and then if you wanted to, you could get uh, certified as an earth-friendly garden. These are just images of what the website will look like when you go there. So here's the microeconomics of sustainable maintenance practices. We want our garden helpers to be our partners in change. So we're asking them to not do all the things that they've accustomed to do. And that could feel like an economic threat from reduced wages and income. But there's already some pressure on these workers from water restrictions and competition. So let's ask them to be our partners and use these skills to add value to the service that they used to give. And then they'll have a competitive advantage perhaps over their other services providers who are unwilling to change. So instead of mow, blow and go, we're going to bloom, groom, 
check, and correct. Trim by hand so the plants aren't damaged repeatedly. And let's check one or more irrigation zones each week so that by the end of a month or two, all the zones will have been checked and serviced. Bring me mulch and compost instead of taking it away. Check the soil most moisture with a um, moisture probe. There are um, Spanish language resources at the um, UC IPM and um, Agriculture and Natural, Natural Resources website. So almost anything that you need help with is, is going to be there in your landscape. And sometimes people ask me to help me to help them with their landscapes. And a friend of mine in my yoga class asked me one day, could I help her with her $590 water bill? And I said, oh yes, I, yeah, just where do you live? And, and when she told me, I was stunned because it was this, this landscape that I had been crying over <laughs> for weeks. And uh, I was so excited um, to be able to work on this landscape because I knew what was possible. And, um, so now I get to take pictures from the inside of the garden instead of just from the street. So now that that melaleuca is, is loose and they're even wider and airier than they were than, uh, from this picture here. So that tight cone is now a place that a bird can fly into. And then the lantana, the ceanothus, and the hibiscus are all in, in uh, full bloom. So there are lots of resources on your handout that I'm going to send electronically. All of these are listed with links that I think there are active links, hopefully. Um, and it's all about the proper use and proper uh, preservation of our resources. Um, the UC Arboretum at UC Davis uh, is continuing their Arboretum All-Star plant studies. There are research stations throughout the state participating in plant studies, including Riverside. So that's uh, the end of that. And I, can, I would like to uh, be able to answer any questions you might have on um, problems you're seeing in your neighborhood. I know there's a big issue in San Diego with um, the, um, the palm weevil. You're seeing a lot of uh, Canary Island date palms go, um, go dead and being removed. There are other pest problems, big pest problems in the, in the county that I know something about. I can ask, answer questions specifically about um, irrigation or, or anything else. How to water trees, the specifics on how to water trees. Um, I, everybody's on mute, so maybe I should unshare my screen. Hi, Shirley. I think I can hear you now. I have a question for you. Yes. I have um, my front yard is is mostly landscaped with with river rock, and I would like to put a tree right in the middle of that area. So I would need something that's not going to drop a lot of leaves or um, debris. Um, and other than that, I don't have any, any serious limits. Where do you live? live? I live in Oceanside, oh, so okay. somewhat near the coast. Oh, okay. And what other, you have rock out there. What other kind of plants? Um, in that area, it's just the rock. There's, my neighbors have a, um, hedge, uh, to the side, but, they don't water that hedge at all. So there would be no water coming from them. And um, I do have a sprinkler system that waters a little tiny bank of, of ornamental sort of things in the very front. Um, but I have total control over that because it's a, it's, I, I turn on the water. It's, it's not on timer or anything. I just do it myself when I want, I yeah. see that it's dry. Well, if it's possible to take that one uh, valve that services that area where the tree is, I would recommend putting um, a ring of, of um, drip irrigation around the tree because that's going to be the best way to establish it. So mm -hmm. you, um, and uh, there's a tree ring irrigation contraption um, handout that you'll get. that will show you how to irrigate it. As far as a choice of tree, 
uh, often when we think about debris, um, you either want really tiny leaves, so you don't really notice that they're there and perhaps they blow away, or large leaves that are easy to blow away. Um, so, you know, all trees generate some kind of uh, tree litter, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I think that's another case of trying to adjust your expectations that having a really nice ring of pretty leaves on top of the rocks is kind of okay. You know, uh, there's this beautiful tree, um, uh, Catalina ironwood, uh, Lionel thamnus, that has these gorgeous leaves, serrated, um, multi tooth, uh, multi branch leaves, very pretty. And when they fall on the ground, the leaves kind of curl, and it's like a, it's like art to me. And, you know, so it's it's really a lot about adjusting your expectations, and they make really pretty white uh, flowers. So. Uh, we planted some out at Catalina recently, and they've been living on rain, just rainfall, which has been very little. So I, I know that that one works. There's Arbutus marina. There's just, there are many, many trees that work. And I'd be happy to, um, under separate phone call, uh, be more specific, and you can show me an image, send me an image of that by email, and that would mm -hmm. really help me. Well, thank you, Lindley. Sure. I'd love that. Yeah. So everybody else is muted if there is a question. I suppose you could put it in chat. Let's see. I see a thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'm open. Uh, you can share my email with the, uh, the class here. And if they have Thanks. specific questions, I'll be happy to help. Well, thanks. I, I don't, it doesn't look like there are any questions. Let's okay, see. so how far out should a tree ring irrigation be and how to measure? Okay, so I'm going to show you that now. I'm going to share my screen again. All right. So uh, if you can see in the upper right image, you'll see the brown uh, line is uh, drip irrigation line, and that drip irrigation line is shown in the, the foil as you get it from the uh, landscape supply. In the middle of this coil is a battery operated timer that just hooks up to a hose bib. And then over here are the other parts, the filter and pressure reducer and the connecting parts to go to this drip line. So this now is, uh, the emitters are spaced at 12 inches apart. And if that is, um, let's say, um, one gallon per hour per emitter, if you have um, 20 feet of this drip line, you will be delivering 20 gallons for each hour that you water. So let's say you've got a new tree, right? And maybe it comes in a five gallon pot. Well, you put the, you first, you take that 20 feet and you uh, don't put it at the trunk. You put it at the edge of where that um, root ball is that you've taken the tree out of the pot from that edge. And then you, um, um, coil it around like a nautilus, making your coils 12 inches apart. But you, you just have one long length, you know, and you're coiling around like you would coil a hose, a regular hose. And then that over time will establish the tree roots um, further out um, than just keeping the water right at the root ball. Now, is that, is that did that answer your question? <laughs> See? Yeah. How to measure, yeah, how to measure. It depends on the tree, how much water you have to deliver as well. But generally trees like to be watered deeply and infrequently. Um, other UC research has shown that if you water the tree down to 18 inches deep, it will be three weeks before you have to irrigate again. It takes a lot of time for that water that's banked in the soil to be utilized by the tree. 
the gizmo that attaches to the spray to change to drip. Oh, the gizmo, oh, this should, don't be so technical. <laughs> it's called a, um, a uh, it's a Rainbird uh, drip retrofit, Rainbird retrofit. Um, let's find it. Stop that show and my slideshow and go back to that. Oh, this Rainbird 1800 retrofit. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's one way, but there are many other ways to convert your uh, zones to, you can convert an entire zone, which would be one valve to drip. And you can run about 250 to 300 feet of that um, inline drip per valve. Okay. That looks good since it has, yes, filter and pressure reduction, because if you put 75 pounds of PSI pressure, um, it kind of blows out the, the um, emitters and the water isn't delivered at a, at a um, regular rate. So you need to pressure reduce and filter. Yep. Okay. That's it, I think. That's the last question. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you so much, Lindley. This was a wonderful session. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah.